we are reset. So welcome back to the very last topic in this series of webinars of the Match Project. We have just finished the topic on take back and end of life strategies. And if you couldn't attend that, I can see we have a few uh, new attendees for, for this session here. Uh, you can stream uh, the previous webinar uh, later today from our website. Now this presentation deals with policy and market that in contrast to the previous eight presentations uh, deals with external factors in a company's circular strategy. Same procedure as all the other webinars, we will spend 20 minutes on the topic and then finish the session with a five minute Q&A. Our two speakers have had their noses in this topic for many, many years. So please test their knowledge and shoot any questions via the Q&A function here in Zoom. And the chat is also open for you to share any additional material that is relevant for all the other circular economy lovers in this room. Our first speaker is Associate Professor Daniela Pigoso from DTU. She has been researching on eco design and circular economy for many years, not only from a technical engineering point of view, but also the implications from outside the organization, such as policies and market. Daniela will be supported by Tim McAloon, who is leading the MATCH project, and he's a professor here at DTU Mechanical Engineering, where he's our expert in the field of product service systems, sustainability, and circular economy. Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lasse. And let's now go towards the final, but not least important dimension in the MATCH platform that has to do with policy and market. And the idea here is really to be able to understand how ready companies are to understand and to influence uh, the policy environment they are, um, they are at, but also how they can enhance the readiness of their customers to uh, accept new circular uh, offerings. And uh, you might be asking, why are we talking about uh, policy, right? And this is indeed a very important uh, area for the implementation of circular economy that can provide a number of different incentives and structures to actually make this transition faster and to enable more companies to be able to uh, engage in that transition. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development have identified those four main areas where policy can really contribute uh, in circular economy implementation. The first one is by providing incentive mechanisms, both for companies and citizens, uh, so that more uh, circular solutions will be developed and will be preferred uh, by, by people. It's also about being able to foster partnerships and collaboration across different types of stakeholders from public organizations to private organizations and uh, civil organizations of different uh, member societies, uh, for instance. It's also extremely important to be able to align circular economy within all of the other mainstream policies that we have implemented in a given country, region or uh, continent but also be able to track actions and to have measurable targets that will be able to show uh, the evolution over time. And recently here uh, in Europe, we have the um, Circular Economy Action Plan that was launched trying to really build upon those four main areas and to boost circular economy implementation in Europe. If we have a deeper look into the uh, action plan, which is part of the European Green Deal, we can see that there are lots of actions in relation to making sustainable products as a norm in Europe, empowering both consumers and also public buyers to take the right decisions uh, in relation to consumption uh, patterns. Uh, they also have a very strong approach to focus on the sectors which present the highest potential uh, for circularity. And there are eight of those sectors uh, going from electronics and ICT to plastics, textiles and food. 
they also are very interested into making circularity work for people, for regions, and also for uh, cities. And here again, building upon the urbanization as one of the key megatrends in the next few years. And then finally, Europe also wants to lead the global efforts uh, on circular economy. And in addition to this kind of legal um, context, we can also see many uh, associations like ISO, uh, for instance, doing um, standards that aim to also support this transition to, to a circular economy. And companies can uh, play a very important role in both defining what those policies and standards will be, uh, but also, uh, of course, influencing them so that we can reach even higher uh, circularity by a very strong uh, involvement of the private sector. Now, the next question is, but why market? Because this dimension brings together policy and market, right? And in this report that was developed uh, in 19 uh, here in, in Scandinavia, it basically shows what's the Nordic market for circular economy. And I took three main graphics uh, of this report to, to make the point for why market is important when making this transition. And the first one shows, uh, based on the opinion uh, of people that was interviewed uh, across Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Finland, who they see uh, as having the biggest responsibility for a circular economy transition. And what's in interesting here is that they said it they said it is themselves. So if you look here, about 70% of the respondents uh, mentioned that citizens are the ones to bear most of the responsibility for a circular economy transition. It's followed by government and municipalities, and just after that, uh, companies. So here we have the three main stakeholders uh, in actually activating that discussion. And then the next question that they asked in this survey had to do with um, what are the attitudes that these different citizens have today in relation to a number of different uh, end of life strategies. And here we can see, uh, for instance, that uh, repairing, buying secondhand products, selling secondhand products and recycling have a very positive uh, attention from those different people, ranging from 50 to 80% of attention. And here you see the data specifically for Denmark and Finland, but we still see some higher resistance when it comes to renting, either renting uh, your things to others. And here we see 30% in Denmark, but even more so if we talk about renting things to others. And here in Denmark, it reaches about 50%. But more important than seeing the attitude and what people is in principle willing to do is to understand what's the gap between uh, intended attitudes and also the actual behavior, right? So the same question here, asking in the past year, how many times have uh, the people perform the same activities that we've just discussed in here. And what's interesting here is to say that even for the areas where people mentioned they had the intention uh, to focus on like repair or buying secondhand, the practice is a little bit different with only, if you look at repair, 12% of people uh, in Denmark repairing products more than 10 times. And that was exactly what we wanted to do here in Match to help companies to understand how they can actually change behavior of their consumers to be able to really um, unlock all of the benefits that we can see from a circular economy implementation. So if we move forward, this is policy and market, the external dimension in the readiness assessment that brings this external view uh, in, in the company's uh, perspectives and how this are actually influencing their strategy and business model, the design of new products and solutions, the take back structures, their organizational structures and so forth. And in policy and market, we had uh, five main questions to the companies in the match platform. So let's have a look at them. 
The first question was, um, how far is your company in influencing the market readiness for second life products or remanufacture, reused or recycled products? And the idea here again is to change behavior to enhance acceptance of those second hand or second life products. The second one had to do with business models. And the idea here was to understand how the company is influencing the market readiness for new business models. For example, leasing or renting instead of selling. The third question that we had in that dimension uh, had to do with the overall value chain. So the question was, how far is your company in co-developing new circular solutions with key stakeholders in the value chain, for instance, recyclers or service providers to ensure that there will be convenience for customers when they uh, need to repair, to upgrade or to dispose uh, their products. Then question number four had to do with influencing sectorial legal frameworks. Uh, and the question here really wanted to understand to what extent companies was taking on their responsibility, but also right to influence uh, the legal structures, either in the country or at a, a regional level, to be able to uh, really advocate for circular economy solutions. And the final one, uh, looking more at national and international level, uh, also looking to influencing and making a difference. We, of course, take as a point of de departure that all the companies are in compliance with legislation. And he really wanted to see how many of them are actually giving one step forward and uh, really being active in transforming the legal and sectorial frameworks towards a circular economy. And uh, I guess you might be as curious as I am to actually see what's the data and what it shows to us. So now over to you, Tim. Thanks, Daniela. So yes, yeah, so let's have a look at the data here. Um, so here's the dashboard for policy and markets. You can see that an overall score of uh, nine out of 25 is showing that it's not one of the most ready areas from uh, those eight dimensions that we've uh, tested on the match platform. And you can see by just looking at the, uh, the yellow bar charts here that there's a trend, which is a downward going trend, meaning that uh, in all areas, the, uh, the most uh, popular answer is, um, well, we've not started. We, we simply don't know the opportunities, uh, regardless of which of the five aspects that Daniela has just been through with us. We can see that uh, by type, the redness is um, pretty similar, whether it's a B2B, B2C or a B2G. Uh, operating company. One thing that surprised us was to see that uh, medium companies and, and micro companies with less than 10 employees actually seem to be the most aware of the policy and market opportunities. Maybe, uh, or you can see also actually that if we look at micro uh, companies and drill down into those here, we can see that in their situation, it's both, it's the, uh, the business models, the second life products, and actually being, um, partners in the value chain to make new business models, which is where they're, they're excelling. So when you start to, to dissect the market and the policy instruments uh, from each other, it's clearly the, uh, the, the market dimensions that the, uh, the small companies and startups are, are seeing the opportunities in here. If we look uh, similarly to the medium companies, uh, they actually look relatively similar uh, to the, uh, the, the startups uh, and smaller companies apart from they're not quite as uh, advanced in the business models area, but looking at markets for second life and, and uh, co-development in the value chain, they're also relatively well advanced. If we zoom back out to the, to the big picture, we can see here that um, building materials and products of glass or ceramics, the companies in this uh, sector, they're clearly the ones which are the best. And we've seen that in a number of the other uh, dimensions that we've been looking at over the last couple of days and you could say that they're 67% roughly uh, ready uh, if you were to take the readiness all, all the way over to a 25, which of course is simply the sum of these five questions where you can answer a maximum of five uh, if you're scaling up or actually running a, an initiative in all of these areas. 
Um, but we can see that they're most ready in terms of looking for uh, second life uh, product markets in terms of looking in uh, the market for co-development. And this is, of course, it's a lot about their tradition working within the, uh, the, the, the building industry or the building sector. There's a long, long and very connected value chain here that uh, they're very used to working within. But also in terms of legislation, uh, this is again about building regulations that they're used to that part of it and also sectorial uh, legislation within their own, their own sector. Where they're not very strong uh, or don't feel themselves ready is in terms of new business models. But nevertheless, they're seeing that um, they're looking at planning pilot uh, uh, operations here. So that was quite interesting to see. Then if we go, maybe just take, uh, I'm looking at the time here, yes, we have time to take a couple of other examples. So if we look at the, the market for uh, new business models, uh, who's doing well here, who's actually scaling up, or what types of companies here. Here we see that uh, chemistry, plastics, and refined mineral oils are where we're seeing the scale up opportunities, and also within the furniture, wood, and paper products uh, sector. Electronics industry is also, or electronics sector, should I say, is also doing uh, relatively well, as is uh, vehicles, which you could say is not too much of a, of a surprise here. And this is about uh, vehicles in sharing systems and so forth, seeing the market opportunities here um, by, by, by doing different types of, of value spreading uh, systems. And then finally, metals and metal products is the, uh, the, the, the lower score within this area in, in uh, being ready for new business models. Yeah, and let's just take uh, one more before I, I go on to the next uh, part, which is a, uh, a look at a case. If we look at the market for co-development, we can see this is a, you could say the most developed of all of the uh, five aspects in this dimension. And here we can see that uh, we have a number of companies looking at scaling up initiatives, a number at, uh, looking at planning up uh, and scaling their initiatives, and a number looking at piloting initiatives. Let's just look at the ones which are actually scaling up. And here we can see that these ones which are scaling up, they're, they're seeing a clear market for second life products. They're pretty good in terms of their own estimations, their readiness for new business models. And they're also understanding how to leverage the legislation, you could say. They're, they're, I think they're moving into a space where regulation and legislation is, is developing or they can see a possibility to develop that legislation. So that's actually quite a, a nice correlation. We don't know whether it's a causality, but we can see there's a correlation between the legislation awareness and readiness and the new business opportunities in some of the areas. And here we can see it's within chemistry, plastics, and refined mineral oils. Uh, then we have a lot of other manufacturing companies. This is often companies which are which see themselves as being um, within a, a, a particular, very specific area which didn't fit into our overall categories. We've done a deeper categorization of each company here, uh, but it could be, for example, connected to the example I'm about to show on the next uh, uh, slide, actually, which is an example which is a quite a different company you'll see from the case in a, in a second. So that's the basically the uh, some of the insights that we get from the data here. And as Daniela mentioned before, for all of these different dimensions and for the whole platform as a whole, we're doing a lot of uh, data crunching now to see what insights we fall, uh, are falling out of this. And we're very, very happy to have the uh, Danish EPA on board on this project because we can show exactly some of the areas where policy instruments can be uh, uh, developed and focused on further. So if we maybe go to, oh, I went to the wrong slide there, I think, but uh, let me just whiz through the, the presentation here. Uh, I'm gonna show you the, the case which connects to this. And here's uh, another type of a production company, right? It's, uh, it's not a product as such, well, it is. The, uh, the product that comes out of this particular creature is uh, dairy products. And there's a, a Danish dairy farm that we brought through our accelerator uh, program, which uh, was a dairy farm from the mainland of Jutland, which is uh, the bit that connects to Germany in Denmark. And basically what they did was to look at what are the opportunities for us as a dairy farm, a uh, rather large dairy farm actually with uh, uh, 2000 uh, cattle, uh, how can they transition uh, to circular economy uh, by using this approach, by looking at what are the policy instruments and how do we connect those together with business opportunities? And what they're asking themselves is, can we be uh, carbon neutral by 2024? 
which is quite a, a, um, an ambition. When we looked into this, this company, we saw many, many activities which were going on, which were already in terms of uh, you could, if we define circularity in a broad perspective, uh, in terms of the way in which they were treating their materials and byproducts and by materials and so forth, also the way in which they were rinsing the water and cooling and, and, uh, and heating and, and uh, many other aspects of the, the operations of this farm. What they were looking to do was to see where they could go one step deeper into the, uh, uh, the, the mapping and, and seeing the areas where we can actually start to, to, to really uh, be, become climate neutral. And we found a, a number of different areas by doing this type of a, of a material flow, but also uh, activity mapping. You can see that there's a cow down here and uh, it becomes to milk, but also at some stage becomes meat uh, for those meat eaters. And we have the, the sales and the service uh, elements. So by doing a deep study of the whole of the activities, uh, the, the product flows, the uh, activity flows and the material flows, we found some really nice opportunities to help this uh, company, uh, the, the, the large industrial dairy farm, to uh, look at circular activities. I must say the match pro, uh, project and program weren't initially designed for this type of production company, uh, but we tried it out to see what the possibilities would be for this. And they were actually nevertheless very, very positive. So we thought we'd uh, close with this case as the final story in our webinars of a, a rather untraditional uh, production uh, company that we had here in the, the, the platform. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to give over to you, Lassa, for, uh, to see if we have any final questions before we close our webinar series. We do. We do. And the first question is for you, Daniela. Consumer behavior seems to be very important uh, these days. How should a company consider that in their circular strategy? That's a good question. And yes, consumer behavior is extremely important from many different points of view. I'd say the first one is that the consumer should want to buy your circular offering. And these should be attractive in relation to all the different options that are available uh, just there. We can see that in general, people are really looking uh, for more sustainable companies uh, and solutions, but it of course needs to come together with all of the other uh, benefits that people expect to get from the products. Performance, functionality, uh, efficiency, cost, uh, and so on and so forth. That's the, the first thing. The other one has also to do with how the people behave once they have your uh, products at hand. And sometimes, and especially for uh, new business models and like renting systems or sharing systems, there are a number of uh, behaviors that might lead to what we call rebound effects that are basically uh, a lower um, advantage from a sustainability point of view than expected due to changes in consumer behavior. So for instance, people not taking as much care of the products they do not own anymore. Uh, and because of that, we having a really short lifetime uh, for, for those products. And, and when companies are designing those systems, it's really important to take consumer behavior uh, into account to try to anticipate what could happen that will lead maybe to a lower sustainability performance and have a very proactive approach to try to counteract that with design measures uh, in relation to the service they are providing or the product design or even the infrastructure uh, around that product. And by doing that, we ensure that we are um, addressing potential drawbacks and maximizing the overall sustainability potential. Thank you. Tim, someone with sharp eyes have uh, noticed that electronic companies have performed poorly throughout all the data sets that we have uh, presented in these webinars. I think this data set is also stored in your mind. Do you have some good explanation of why that is? Yeah, I mean, remember these uh, responses are self-responses and, and it's a self-assessment of their readiness. So uh, we don't know who these companies are because we can't uh, go in and see individually who they are. We can see the aggregated results. But we know, of course, the ones that we've been working with, which are in the electronics uh, industry, um, uh, that have told us and shared their, their responses and their data with us. I think that... Um, 
partly about the 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 question the the question I answered in the in the previous webinar, which was about um, again why did the electronics companies perform uh, not quite as well uh, in terms of the the take back and and uh, end of life strategies. I think it's similar here. Um, it it was a little surprising in terms of a um, a policy and market understanding perspective that uh, they didn't feel themselves more ready. Um, but um, of course, we need to remember that w the data we're showing here are as good as the respondents. And I'm not saying the, the people, the respondents, but the the, the sample of the respondents. Um, and uh, we had a good representation of electronics companies here in Denmark, um, uh, which was the, the main bulk of the uh, of, of the responses, but I think that if we were, one were to go to, uh, if there were this were a German pro project, for example, we'd see many more electronics companies than uh, we would see pharma companies in in the, the spread, and maybe we get a slightly different uh, view uh, from that. I don't know, but I think that uh, for the same answer I gave before in terms of reacting to relatively strong legislation and regulation within the European system means that we, we perform to, to baseline and to, to minimum requirements. And uh, that setting ourselves above that uh, seems to be uh, often uh, um, lacking in companies which are, are more highly regulated. It could be an answer to the question. Great, thank you. I think that was uh, probably the last question uh, for uh, our series of webinars here. I also want to allow people to go on weekend. Um, personally, I would like to thank all the participants for uh, attending and for raising all of these questions. I think we have just surpassed 100 questions during uh, this week. So thank you for that. Feel free to uh, stay in touch with us and reach out uh, either on LinkedIn or on email. And then Tim, you have been the lead of the project. And I think uh, with respect to you, I will allow you to have the last word in the webinar. And perhaps you can share with us what we can expect from Match in the future. Yes, of course. Thanks, Leza. And uh, so you see in front of you now the all the webinars. And by tonight, we'll, the, the final two will have a, a nice arrow sign on. We'll put those on the website. We'll also put on the website a... Um, a transcript of the Q&A that will be next week when we've got a chance to, to also write the answers that we uh, verbally answered to you so that you can see all the questions and answers that came up during the webinars and we'll also put a copy of uh, the slides there uh, or at least a version of it that we're allowed to share uh, slides wise on the website so go into the the match website to look at those thank you so much for uh, participating in the, the webinars we've had great fun making them uh, it's quite a uh, uh, it builds the adrenaline to make these types of webinar and it also makes us very sharp in uh, presenting but also asking answering the many questions that you gave us which we thought were were extremely spot on and, and very interesting to make us think uh, deeply about uh, what we're uh, we're about the match project is coming to a close uh, in its uh, current form at the end of february so our our funding and our, our project framework is closing uh, but um, we believe that this work has just begun and is just beginning. We can see that this has been focused on the production companies on manufacturing industry, even though we had a, a dairy farm as the last one. That was an eye opener because we saw there was a great potential within agri-foods. We've also seen there's a great potential within the marine industry uh, or maritime industry rather, and also another uh, group of different industries. So we're looking to see how we can expand the match platform in many different areas and sectors to make sector specific uh, platforms in different areas. Also, we've had m extremely many um, uh, contacts in terms of people who would like to have it in their country. Uh, because when we go for this type of a, a platform, which is going to be specific so that everybody in the organization in principle can answer the questions, then it's nice to have it in your own language. And we're also looking into seeing if we can get support to do that. And then we'll be reaching out to uh, people in different countries if they would like to somehow participate on a, another language uh, version of that. So all of this will come later. What we will allow ourselves to do is to send you just one email after this when we're ready with all the data and all of the, uh, the finished webinars to number one, inform you it's there. Number two, to um, ask you what your opinion was on this and all of the nine webinars. And number three, to see if you would be interested in hearing from us in the future 
if one of these opportunities I just mentioned uh, comes up. So that's just a, a short summary. This is the last slide, and uh, this is an important one for us to, to, uh, to show. What we've been showing in this week is a, a load of data. And on the very first webinar, we showed you these eight dimensions where we've just been through the last two of take back and end of life strategies and policy and markets today. We also showed you some demographics in terms of where in the world and which type of sectors uh, we're looking at and which types of, of competencies within the company we've looked at. All of this, we're very busily writing up into uh, papers at the moment. So look out as well for, for these. We're gonna keep the Match uh, website completely updated with tools and cases. And uh, also uh, as these papers come out, they'll be available. Many of you have been very interested in the data and they're gonna be put into our papers. Finally, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to the uh, Danish uh, Industry Foundation for supporting this project. Uh, support means not just the financing, but also to, to really give us the, the backup and having the Danish Industry Foundation for us has been instrumental in getting the Danish companies on board because this has been uh, until now uh, uh, basically a, a Danish fo focused project, even though you can see from the, from the previous uh, animation, there were 38 countries represented, so not only Denmark. And also thanks to the Confederation of Danish Industry, the Danish Environmental Protection Ag Agency, and the think tank Cora 2030 for being on the, uh, the steering group for this project who've uh, uh, nudged us in the right direction and acted as guinea pigs when we were developing the, the match platform. So many thanks to, to all of those organizations. And finally, thanks to you for, for joining these webinars, uh, both from, uh, from Daniela, from Lessa, and from me, and from all the match team that have been along on the project underway. Thank you. Thank you and see you around. Thank you.